Whew. Alrighty. Alrighty. So uh, if you all would, please, let's all stand up. Let's open up to the book of Matthew this morning. Let's open up to the book of Matthew this morning. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, that's page number 1283. 1283. Now, it's interesting what's going on around the world right now. That obviously in the media, you know, COVID seems to be dying down a little bit. They're not really talking much about it. We heard for the past months or so about this mutation is going to transform into this mutation. Watch out for this new mutation. It's going to get into this one. And this is going to affect you this way. And, you know, now it's kind of seemed to be dying down a little bit. I could go and get some breakfast or get some lunch. and I don't got to see people wearing masks and things like that anymore. And we're living in strange times, honestly. It's like, you know, you think about it. It's the only time in, uh, in history that I could say that I walked into a bank with a mask on, walked out with, and got money, and I didn't get arrested. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, a, what crazy times we're living in. But, of course, um, you know, now, what, what's, what's going on now, it's these wars. So now it's from one thing, it's from one fear now to the next. Now we've got to deal with wars and rumors of wars and, and all these things. You know, back then, uh, you know, obviously Russia invading Ukraine and China thinking about invading Taiwan. And, um, you know, back, back a couple years ago, there was this big scare about North Korea. You know, Kim Jong-un, young guy, he's crazy. I think he's going to throw a nuke over at us or something like that. You know, that's a, what a joke that was. You know, Kim Jong-un trying to attack the United States. That's a joke. But just all this fear that obviously that the media puts upon us. That's why it's recommended. I don't know where the statistic are. I heard it's not, it's not recommended to watch any more than 15 minutes a day of the news media. And that's why it's important to come to church. That's why it's important to have, you know, personal Bible studies, which, which you, your wife, your family, every single day. You know, it's me as a preacher coming behind the pulpit for one hour. I got to like, you know, almost undo all the things that you guys have been saturated in throughout the whole week. Probably saturated into the wrong things and into hearing the wrong things. So... You know, it's, it's important that we fellowship around the Word of God. It says over there in the book of Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as we see the day approaching, more so as we see the day approaching. So, you know, of course, they want to shut down churches. They don't want to, they want to close the doors. And it's amazing. I hear from church, you know, churches out there that just lost their whole congregation. Churches just closing the doors because, well, now it's comfortable. Now I can just sit back at home. I can sit back, obviously, in my pajamas and my slippers and you know, drink my cup of coffee, and just I could just watch Preacher on TV now. You know, that's, what the, that's not right. That's not good. We're supposed to assemble ourselves together personally. It's important. Now, uh, we'll just preach a little message this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. Let's, uh, let's all read this here. Matthew 24, verse 1 through 8. Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him, for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as his disciple, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Preach a little message this morning entitled, The Beginning of Sorrows. So uh, if we all bow our heads, JP, would you mind blessing the message? Lord, um, we pray for your preacher this morning, that he would just deliver us the truth, Lord, and uh, speak your word. I would have your word to the authorized King James Bible. Yeah. Pray you just give us peace in, in these days, Lord, and just open our, our hearts to this message. And um, pray you bless this message in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe seated. Now, you know, obviously, you know, anybody with the with with right mind, you know, the world is becoming just heavy with troubles. You know, obviously. You know, there's, there's so, much, so much anxiety, so much depression. Um, 
it's just it's falling apart all around us. And I, I hopefully at the end of this message, this isn't to get you down into the dumps, down into the doom and gloom of it all. But this is these are actually exciting times for a Christian, you know, because you know what. I go all that. I don't really need to be saturated so much in the news media. I do believe it's important to okay know what's going on in the world, but always, always come back to the Word of God. Okay, so you look at the things going on and you come back and you judge all things in this world by what this book says. Okay, you know Jesus just said all the main things. There should be uh, verse number seven: nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. That's what the news media says. You know, if it isn't if it isn't about they're trying to get you scared about pestilences or okay, then then we're gonna try to get you feared up about wars and oh he's gonna attack me or he's gonna North Korea's gonna attack us or whatever. And if it's not about the wars and pestilences, well now we gotta watch out for the earthquakes, now we gotta watch out for the tornadoes and the tsunamis and all these other natural disasters and things that the uh you know, news media really uh jumps on all those things. Um let's just wanna I just wanna look at a verse in Psalms chapter nine here. Just Couple verses, you know. Obviously, this week I was going to preach on the uh, the Godhead again, but last night I was just thinking, ah, this this should be covered. So I kind of just kind of put this thing together in an hour. I hope the Lord blesses it. Um, might be going all over the place, but we'll see. Hopefully, get a blessing out of it. Psalms chapter nine, verse twenty. It's page seven seven eight. Seven seven eight. It's a good good little verse here in the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter nine. Psalms chapter 9, verse 20. It says, Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. That the nations to know themselves to be but men. You know, government made up of a bunch of men. And, and, and the whole point, you, you look up at a, I think it's in this passage here. Um, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, verse number 17, look at this verse. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. you got a government, obviously, that starts to forget God, that starts to pull away, and you know, I'll talk about the, the God of this Bible. Then the, then the Lord don't want nothing to do with the nation. You know, he, may, he may bless you, then next thing you know, he'll pluck you out, and all nations are as a drop in the bucket, the Bible says. In the moment that, you know, of course, the governing body of that nation, they forget God, God turns his back on that nation. Okay, he don't want nothing to do with them. Um, Okay, so now I want to look at another one in James chapter 4 here. You know, the, the purpose of war. What, what's the whole big deal about, the, about war? Well, this is a big answer, I think. And uh, there's a good old saying that, you know, war is uh, judgment for sin on this earth. Okay? And uh, hell is judgment on sin hereafter. Okay? So war is just a constant reminder. We live, it, it, like the songs we sung, in this old sinful world. Um, you know, uh, it says in that song, um, yeah, living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford, striving alone to face temptation sore, where can I go but to the Lord? And obviously that's what we ought to be doing in these days and age. We ought to just go, go to the Lord in all things. So look at James chapter 4 here. This is a good passage. The whole purpose of war. Look at James chapter 4, verse number 1. It says, From whence, whence come wars and fightings among you, Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war. Ye, a ye have not because ye ask not. And then the whole thing right there, the main purpose of wars is people desire things. It's a lust issue. Okay, lust isn't just always about sexual matters, but lust is also about materialistic things. People want to go to war for what reasons? Because, well, you got something that I don't have. I want your land. I want your oil. I want your resources. I want your people. Um, I want, it's, it's international covetousness. That's what it is. Covetousness is a sin. And that thing's on an individual level, and that thing's on a national level. We want something that, that, that we don't got, so we're going to go and kill you for it. It's barbaric, you know, when you think of it. Um, that stuff hasn't changed. You know, the first murder in the Bible was Cain killing his brother. You know, that thing, murder goes back. And you read the Bible, it's a bloody book. There's a lot of wars and things like that. And, it, and, uh, and that's something we've got to deal with in this world. Now, in another part, and look, at, look at 1 Timothy. I think it's another one, obviously. 1 Timothy, a couple books over, page 1586. Another, obviously, purpose of war in the men that are behind the government and pulling strings of, and, all this, and all this stuff, you know. What's, what's the big deal about it? It's money, obviously. Although, you know, 
Another old saying is, you know, if you don't understand something, there's always a buck in it. There's always some money to be gained out of all this stuff here. Somebody's always making money, okay? Um, you know, while the destruction of certain classes may be, you know, pulled down, you know, there's always people in the high, in the, up in the high realm that are making money from all this stuff, from destruction, from famines, from pestilences, from war. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look at verse number 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 10. 1 Timothy 6.10, look at this. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It is the root of all evil, money. Now, that's not, it's not, that's not saying that money within itself is evil. It's, it, love, it's the love of it, the, co the coveting after this thing to where I'll kill you, I'll sell drugs for you, I'll do anything, I'll do anything un, un, wicked and vile just to get this money in my hand, just to fatten up my, my pockets and stuff. That's wicked. They love it. They, they, you know. And that's the whole thing, obviously, in this world is, you know, you know that's why Jesus said, you know, we, uh, you cannot serve God and mammon. And God is the, and mammon is the money, uh, is the God of money. So obviously, and that's what's sad is that's what mainly rules people in this world is I got to get up. I got to, it's just the, the paycheck, my wallet, everything, just my bank account. That's what rules me. That's what guides me. That's what motivates me. That's not right. That's serving. Your mindset is just focused all on the money and not focused on God himself. God will provide. Always remember that. You know, God may have blessed you with all kinds of abilities, but if it wasn't God for giving you those abilities, you wouldn't be where you're at right, where you're at right now. You know, always give glory back to God. You know, you start getting carried away with the love of money. It says it's the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, there's obviously stories out there, people putting all their money and in investing in stocks and all this. And next thing you know, they, their bank account's wiped out. What do they do? They go jump off a building or something. They go commit suicide or something because all their, their whole life was just, just revolved around their money and things. Um, Come to Galatians real quick, just to get an idea about this world. Come to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. It's page 1545. Galatians chapter 1. Look what the Apostle Paul says here in Galatians chapter 1. Verse number 4. He says, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this beautiful, wonderful, glorious, excellent, lovely world. Is that what it says? Not at all. That he may deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul likens this world, and that's the mindset of a Christian. That's why the whole thing, you've got to scrap that theory of evolution where things are going to get better and better over time, and we're going to evolve into higher consciousness and stuff. That's a bunch of baloney. We, you know, Adam, he was at the top, and he fell. We're not getting better and better. As a matter of fact, things are falling apart. That's what the Bible says. We've got to get that mentality of evolution, and man's going to solve all of man's problems. No, this whole humanistic philosophy of uh, man is the measure of all things and all that. But Paul says it right there, clear as day, this present evil world. So like we sung that song, living below in this old sinful world. Another thing we sung at him earlier, it says that's farther along. You know, it says, tempted and tried, we're oft made to wander. Why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Now that word molested, you know, you look at the 1828 dictionary definition, it means bothered, disturbed, troubled, annoyed. And that's the whole thing. You know, there's people around us never molested, though in the wrong. And you, you think about that, that verse and that song. We as Christians, obviously Bible-believing Christians, we ought, to be, we ought to be fed up with sin. You know, and if you're not fed up with sin, you're, obviously you're, you're reading the wrong stuff, you're filling your mind with the wrong things. Uh, you know, people are not, are not troubled these days with the promotion of drugs. There's people walking around that are not troubled by the promotion of uh, promiscuity, just flaunting themselves off and all this pride and social media and just, you know, we live in a generation, it's crazy. You look at the media, you look at all these social media platforms, Snapchat and, and, uh, and Instagram and TikTok and things. You know, there's a study on that where there's algor algorithms, they promote stupidity. Those algorithms, they promote stupidity when you look at it. Because it's crazy, these people, all they do, they get up on this thing, on this, they make a 15 second clip, 
showing themselves, being promiscuous, they get millions of dollars. They get rich over this stuff from advertising themselves like that. Young people, they're coming at the youth with, with all that. It, and then you go over to China's algorithm with the same platform. They promote like science and engineering and things that are you know, productive with your mind and creations and creativity. They're, this, whole, so this whole TikTok, this stuff, is, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to society. You can look up a bunch of articles on that stuff about social media you know, and, how, and how it just promotes people being stupid. You know, you look at this stuff on this other thing, people just stuffing their faces, eating all kinds of food. For what? For views. They get these views, and then what happens? Then they get all this money. <laughs> While people are busting their back over, you know, doing a labor job or, or sitting behind a, a, an office figuring out these, these, you know, computer programs or whatever, or whatever it may be, but there's people out there getting rich off of being stupid. You know, what, what, kind of, what kind of world is that, you think of it? The Bible already has that whole number. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, Woe unto them that put good for evil and evil for good. So things get warped. What was once thought was bad and evil, ah, now it's okay, now it's good. We live in a different generation, different times. The Word of God don't change. That's why this is our, our, our standard. I'm not to overthrow this thing and say, you know, let's just keep up with the times and stuff. F forget about that, okay? Um, <clears throat> you know, and there's another hymn that goes, uh, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. You know, my, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And that's the thing, obviously, of, of them old preachers back in the day. It was to always get you not live, you know, comfortable down here in this world, but to really stir you up to make you homesick for heaven. I want to be home with, with my Lord. I want to be home and, 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 and see my, you know, my loved ones that are up there. I want to I wanna see the Lord. I want to, you know, see the one that loved me enough to die for me and things. And, you know, nowadays Christianity is all flipped. It's all about how can you have your best life now and all this prosperity and, you know, God wants you rolling around and, and, and just swimming in all kinds of wealth and things, all this positive psychology stuff. Uh, look at the Apostle Paul's life. Look at the Apostle Paul's life. And you see, he's the pattern for us Christians. The Apostle Paul, man, he was persecuted. He was thrown in jail. He was uh, shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was whipped. The guy had no kids, the guy had no, uh, no home. <laughs> the guy had no, he had two clothes on his back, you know, a, a jacket. That's the Apostle Paul. Because all the prosperity, all the riches, he, that's heavenly minded, man. He was thinking about the long run, he was thinking about eternity. Not all down here. Um, and, that, and that's the whole thing. We, I can't feel at home in this world anymore, that's true. Uh, let's look at another one, look at Second Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. People always ask this thing, well, God, all this stuff, if God was so good, he was all powerful, why are we still suffering? You know, well, what's the point of suffering? Suffering, I mean, that's to get you stirred up because I don't want to be down here anymore. If this was heaven on earth, what would be the point of me dying and going up to heaven? <laughs> if I could just have a perfect life down here on earth, what would be the purpose of me dying and going up to heaven where things are perfect? Because this world ain't perfect. It's sinful. It's wicked. And I'll tell you, the hardest thing to get that through it's through the head of younger people. You know, that thing, I was fighting that thing forever. You know, I come getting into college and getting into school. I'm going to conquer the world. I know every single thing. Ain't nobody going to tell me nothing. How many people, young people, were ever like that? Or is that just me? <laughs> you ain't going to tell me nothing. I'm a philosopher. I got this thing all figured out. Next thing the Lord had to really knock me down and say, you're dumb and stupid. You better humble yourself, you know. Humble yourself to me. And then I'll, I'll build you up slowly. Your, my whole process was wrong when it comes to come to the world, honestly. I thought this world was a decent place. I thought this world was good and, you know, the, the greater good of mankind and all that. I, I was deceived big time. Look at Peter, says, Second Peter, page 1630. 1630. Look what Peter says here. Page 1630, book of Second Peter. He goes back, he mentions a character in the Old Testament named Lot, okay? It's interesting. Matthew chapter 24 Jesus likens these end times, these, these times that we're living in before his coming, he likens it unto the days of Lot and the days of Noah. So you ought to do a study on the days of Lot and Noah. You'll find it was a wicked time. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 here real quick. 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, let's see, I want verse number, uh, um, verse number 5. 2 Peter, chapter, or, yeah, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 5. Look what he says here. It says in, in verse 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher 
of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. God gave, you look at that study of Noah's Ark, God, he was building that ark with him and his kids for 120 years, constantly preaching. The flood's coming, the flood's coming, it's going to rain, you better get ready, you better prepare to meet that God, the Lord's coming back, he's given us 120 years, you guys want to come on the boat, come on the boat. What'd they do? They missed the boat. That's the whole, the whole way you get the expression at. Oh, he, he missed the boat. Hun hundreds of millions of people missed the boat when it comes to Noah preaching about righteousness, doing something what is right, Ho you know, holiness. That's, what, that's missing in today's Christianity. Sanctification, preaching righteousness, preaching against sin. God gave them 120 years to get right. L look at Noah's outcome. Who'd he save? He saved eight people. You know, it gets this whole big thing about numbers. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 24 where it says uh, many will be deceived. The majority gets over, overthrown and things like that. Eight people got saved. That's small, man. It was his family. Look at verse 6, though. In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. The, the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, God poured fire and brimstone down upon that thing. That's, that's a remembrance. That's a whole a good old expression too. Is what, you know, what men learn from history is that they never learn from history. You don't remember history, then you're condemned to repeat it. And that whole thing of Sodom and Gomorrah and the whole thing of uh, and Peter's recollecting that from history. Yeah, that's what God did. He flooded the world because he was fed up with, with sin. It says in Genesis, every imagination of the, of the thought of men was only evil. Then you, look at, then you look at Sodom and Gomorrah. What was wrong with them? Now, and the whole big thing is, of course, homosexuality. Yes, that was wrong. They were, you look in Ezekiel, they were prideful. They were, they were lifted up with the abundance of bread. They had all kinds of food. Now, listen, this sounds like America. <laughs> they were uh, uh, homosexuality. They were lifted up from the abundance of food. Uh, prideful. Um, and there was one more. Um, oh, an abundance of idleness. An abundance of idleness. They didn't do nothing. They sat around and had a good time and drank and just idleness is in the land. God overthrew that city for those sins. We do a whole study on Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's, you know, like I said, I've been watching some cool stuff on archaeology. That city's still around today. That should be a big highlight mark. You know, this should be, this should be on the news. This should be mainstream in the science textbooks. Look what God did to this city. And you read about Sodom. That place was well watered. It was as the garden. It was as the Garden of Eden, Sodom. That's why Lot went down to the city, because that place was good. It had water, it, had, it was beautiful, it had these trees. You look at that thing today, present day, that thing's nothing. You can see the structure still there, nothing but brimstone. And they're carving these brimstone out of the rock of this wall. It's like 98% brimstone. They're lighting this stuff on fire. It's everywhere. Pure brimstone. That's a sign of God to say, look what I could do to the city 3,000 years ago. You can see highways in it, and now look at it. It's gone because of them sins. Look what now, anyways, look at verse 7. And delivered, now look what happened. People got saved from that city. And delivered just Lot. Look, look, look what Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. We ought to be vexed. Now, that definition for the word vexed means provoked, irritated, troubled, agitated, uh, disquieted, afflicted. Lot was, go was around that land. And, you know, uh, I forget the number. How many people were saved in Sodom and Gomorrah? Lot, what was it? Eight or nine. Was it eight or nine that, that fled? Yeah, under, under ten people were saved in Sodom. He called them out. And it says, but Lot, his righteous soul was vexed day by day. And that's, that's, that should be us Christians, should be the same thing. We ought to be looking around at all this sin. And we ought, it ought to vex us. It ought to discomfort us, in a sense. You ought to, you know, people say, ah, well, who cares? What can I do about it? You know, I got my own life. I got my own troubles. I, you know, all well, around this, it's sin. We, and us Christians, we are not to, you know, have a low attitude towards that and just push that aside and make everybody feel comfortable when we're not supposed to feel comfortable. And Lot was, was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. We ought to be vexed when we hear foul things, when we hear wrong things. But that's the problem with media, watching movies, filling your mind with the wrong things. You become desensitized to it. So, ah, it's, it's not a big deal, you know. Well, it is a big deal. You know, back in the day, men wouldn't even cuss around 
or cuss around a woman. When a woman came in the door, they'd say, oh, we've got to clean up a little bit. Let's watch our mouth. You know, not a, men are cussing like crazy, even the women. <laughs> women got mouths like, like truckers and stuff. That's not right. It's not good, you know. Uh, and it should vex us in the conversation, the way that people live and things like that. Um, you know, Peter it says there, Lot's righteous soul was vexed day to day by the filthy conversation of the wicked. Come to, uh, come to ver- Matthew chapter 5. Now, us as a Christian, here's something that, that's big. We ought to, like what the Lord says, if you want a blessing this morning, we're here, here's how to get a blessing. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. It's page number 1241. Uh, Matthew uh, chapter 5. If you want a blessing, well, here's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's about to give us a blessing, so don't miss out on it. Look what Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6 says. 1241, it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you want a blessing in your life, if you want spiritual power, spiritual victory, you ought to be hungry and you ought to be thirsty for righteousness. And that's a lot of people, they don't care about that. They don't want righteousness, you know, because righteousness tells you, man, I mean, tell me, Lord, I can't be doing this thing anymore. You know, I know this, I know this thing's unclean. I'm going to put it in my body. I know I shouldn't be watching this. And you mean to tell me I can't do this stuff anymore? You know, we, we, who are we? We start arguing with the Lord. I got I to gotta give this thing up here? Yeah, it's not right because it's, 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 it's filthy. It's, un, it's unrighteous. That's why there's no power. There's no spiritual power in our walk with God because at the end of the day, people don't care about righteousness. They don't thirst after it. They don't got a desire. They don't hunger after righteousness, you know. And, uh, and there's another thing a lot of Christians lost. Look at Psalms chapter 69. Psalm 69. We lost that, that righteous indignation is, is, is what it's usually called. Meaning, you know, we ought to pray, you know, and this whole thing, this whole thing about righteous indignation, we ought to pray sometimes for the Lord to destroy people. And you say, well, whoa, what do you mean? Look what Paul said to the, to the, in the book of Corinthians. Deliver that guy over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. But in the day of the Lord, that his spirit may be saved. He's even talking about another Christian. He said, look, if he was a genuine saved Christian, he ain't living right. Deliver him over to Satan. Satan will destroy his flesh. But in the day of the Lord, that his spirit may be saved. You know, once saved, always saved, no doubt about it. But your flesh can get delivered over to Satan, and Satan will destroy you. Now look at this in the book of Psalms, Righteous Indignation. Look what David says here. Look at Psalms 69 here. I'll give you a chapter of Psalms 69. Look at verse number Look at verse number 24. David's writing, he says, Pour out thine indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. And they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Look what David says. Add iniquity unto iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. You say, why is it, what is all that? Let them not come. We're praying. Most Christians, we pray for people to get saved. No doubt about it. There comes to a time in the point of people's life where the people's hearts grow so cold that there's literally almost no hope for them. You know, and God uses them, them certain people to uh, you know, pour upon wrath and to use them as examples and things because they're so past feeling. They don't want nothing to do with the truth. They don't want nothing to do with, with God. And then they wreak havoc to society. And then they, then they wreak havoc to other people that are trying to do right and trying to raise their kids right and things. And that's no good. Them people are, their people are no good. Look at verse 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. And then David goes on, but I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy, sal- let thy salvation, o-, o God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. And it's, it's in David, I am poor and sorrowful. Man, that's humility. That's being humble. You know, these sinners, that's what's wicked about all of it. Is people, no, d- no doubt, everybody's sitting here right now is a sinner. We sin every single day. But our attitude, we should mourn about it. We shouldn't be all comfortable about it. And it should bug us. It should bother us. But David, he, he's saying them, those types of people, they're lifted up within their sin. They're lifted up in pride. David says, I'm poor and sorrowful. Meanwhile, David was the king of Israel. I'm poor and sorrowful. David, he, he, was, he was a man after God's own heart. But you see the spirit of David, man. And obviously he knows, you know, you set yourself low and God, God will lift you up on high. Um, you know, that's it's this whole thing about uh, 
you know, th this whole philosophy that, now listen, we, I love singing about the love of God. I love, you know, for God so loved the world, you know, the, the riches and the love of Christ. If you miss the love of God, you miss the, you miss the greatest love the world ever had to offer. You're not going to find it in Hollywood. You're not going to find it from one another even. You know, the true love comes from God himself. I believe that for hardly obviously. But you cannot neglect the wrath of God. You cannot neglect the anger of God. The God's fed up. God gets fed up with people, so he pours out his wrath. And you know, listen, God's 100% love. Where does he manifest that love for eternity? He manifests that love in heaven. God's 100%. He ain't 50-50. You know, you say, how, how could you be 100% of both attributes? I don't know. That's God attribute. <laughs> he's 100% love. He's 100% wrath. 100% wrath. He's balanced. Nowadays, people got an unbalanced view of God. Ah, he's 50% this. He's 25% that. He's God. He's 100% love, 100% wrath. Where does he manifest his wrath for eternity? Hell. <laughs> That's it. It's obvious. It's bad. It's an easy equation to figure that thing out. He manifests his love in eternity. In heaven, he manifests his wrath in hell for eternity. They're both forever. Okay, and that's the whole thing. People, you know, saying forget about hell and all that. They don't want to think about that. They don't want to think about death. And I don't, I don't, like, I don't like the particular thing about hell. Who does? <laughs> Who likes to think about, man, I know right now people are dropping, like just dropping down into the heart of the earth. Scientists will tell you there's molten nickel down there. You know, they don't tell you there's no souls down there. Though. There's people, there's souls down there. As, as, as we're sitting here, that's why people get so comfortable and so caught up in the world of death. That's why the devil raised up television and, 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 and media and all this entertainment and all these hobbies and all these little things to get you so distracted from the spiritual realm. The devil got people bound by that stuff. And it may be good things. You know, hey, what's wrong with, what, you know, what's wrong with, with going fishing? Well, there ain't nothing wrong going fishing unless you put fishing above the things of God. You know, the devil can use all kinds of things to get you distracted. You know, what, what's, I know people, what's wrong with, with snowboarding? What's wrong with golfing? What's wrong with hunting? What's wrong with all those things? There's nothing wrong with them, okay? They're, they may be good within themselves, but when those things take a hold of you and, you know, you're, you're starts, you know, I, I got I to miss church. I got to go on this. I got to go snow. I got to snowboard. I got to go fishing. I got to go hunting. I got to do all these things. Can't come to church. Can't read my Bible. Then you got to, we got to watch out because the devil can use a good thing and twist that thing, okay? And just a little warning. All right, now, next point I'm going to talk about here real quick is just the uh, <clears throat> United States of America, okay, the USA. Um, you know, it's, you know, well, just a real quick point. The church has become so ignorant to what is in store for the future. The church, Christians, we're supposed to know the truth, and a lot of us, they just became ignorant of what's going to happen in the future. To when, obviously, when things really break loose in America, they ain't going to know what hit them. Because most of the, like I said, I never, I never put the blame on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the sheep. It's always the, the people feeding the sheep. They're not feeding them right, not feeding them the right food, not warning them, You're not telling them, hey, watch out for this, look out for that. It's all about this, this good stuff and how to feel comfortable. You've got to watch out. You've got to have warnings. You've got to have, have those things. And, um, you know, that's what you, you got to just be aware of that. Now, listen, now, I was thinking last night, God gave us two presidents over the last two terms that really sum up the state of our nation in the state of Christianity. We could learn a lot from Donald Trump. We could learn a lot from Joe Biden. We learn a lot from them. Those two, that's a, those are perfect. God put them people in office to show you the state, I believe, the state of Christianity. And you look at Donald Trump's character. What was he? He was prideful. He was perverse. He had a big mouth. He was all talk, you know, stuff like that, just, just coming in the room and uh, lustful. He said some, you know, said some wrong things and stuff like that. Uh, he, he, was, he was lukewarm at best. He was a lukewarm Christian, Donald Trump. Well, that sums up the, the day and age we're living in as a whole, <laughs> as us Christians. Bunch of lukewarm Christians. And you look at Joe Biden. Guy's tired. He's sleepy. He can't remember what he's doing, where he's at, what he got to say. You know, we always make fun of him, Sleepy Joe. Well, a lot of you Christians are like Sleepy Joe. Really. A lot of you, a lot of you Christians sitting here, you guys are like Sleepy Joe. You don't care. Yeah, oh, what was I going to say here? Oh, I forget. What, what did the preacher just talk about on Sunday? Oh, I forget. What did I just read last today in my Bible, my daily reading? Oh, I forget. You know, <laughs> people, Christians, are like Sleepy Joe. They're like Donald Trump. They're lukewarm. There's two presidents. It, it just, how that thing fits, it just, it's like, there's a perfect picture of the state of America. They represent, supposed to represent America. Well, a lot of rep Christians are like Donald Trump. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people are like Donald Trump. A lot of people are like Joe Biden. And look at the book of Hebrews real quick. You know, Christians today, they're consumed by lust. They're all talk. 
They may go to church. They may read their Bible. They may say a couple prayers. They may go, you know, they may be spiritual around one, run, one group of people. And the next thing you know, they're completely different around another group of people. They're like chameleons. And then, uh, you know, we got come to, where was it? Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Or Hebrews chapter 2. Look at this verse. Good one. Hebrews chapter 2. 1599. Hebrews chapter 2. You know, people, uh, you know, they may claim to be Christians and talk about Jesus, but their social media says otherwise. Social media, I mean, that thing is, you know, if you, if you don't know about social media as a kid, as a young person even, you got to watch what you put on there. You got to clean up your, your testimony. If you got filthy stuff on the social media before you were saved, get that stuff off the social media. I mean, it should be all common sense types things, you know. The social media, you know, coming to church next to you, you know, oh, look at me on my storyline. I'm out there drinking. I'm out there doing all this filthy stuff, you know, talking. I'm cussing on my story and stuff. What are you doing? You know, it's like, well, this should, that should be simple, basic things. Look at the book of Hebrews, though. You know, the other point, obviously, is Christians today, they're getting tired. They're getting worn out. They can't remember where they are, and they can't remember what they're supposed to be doing as a Christian. <laughs> that's Sleepy Joe. They can't remember what he's doing. That's, that's Christians. You know, look what it says here in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. It's a great verse. We've got to take the more earnest heed. We've got to take this stuff way more seriously. You come into church, and we, you know, a lot of people they just want to get their ears tickled and things, but we've got to remember these things. We've got to meditate upon the Word of God in and you know, the whole thing, you know, people, oh, I don't care how many times you've been through the Bible. You know, I've been through the Bible four times myself. Well, okay, big deal. How many times did the Bible really get through me, though? You know, you can read this whole thing and read it and read it. But if it ain't doing nothing in your life, what are you, what are you doing? What's, something's wrong. Something's off. And most of the part's always our part, obviously. You know, we don't want to yield. We want to hang on to, I want to hang on to what I want to do. That, that, that pride, that spirit of, of the devil. That's what caused him to fall. He was prideful. But the point, we've got to keep these things in remembrance. Remember what, what, what sermons are about. Remember what, 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 what we're learning. You know, not just to walk out and just forget it and just, just blank out and stuff. Look at, uh, look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. I always, this part always stuck out to me. It's obviously the gospel. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's page 1527. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is a big one. You know, there's times I'm just thinking about my day. Man, thank you, Lord, you saved me. You know, thank you, Lord, you shed your blood for me. Thank you, Lord, you buried, you resurrected the third day. You know, like that song we sung, one, one day. You know, bury he carried, my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever and all that. You know, just keep, obviously keeping this in memory. Look what it says here, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. That's a big deal right there. We've got to keep in memory. And Paul's talking to the Corinthians. You Corinthians, you better keep in memory what I preached unto you. You know, and, and bear fruit for the Lord. And, and, and what I was warning, you know, we're, gonna, we're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study in Corinthians. We're taking a pause from it, though, but... We're going to see in the book of Corinthians that they were very carnal church and things, and Paul was trying to get them to clean up, trying to help their testimony and stuff, get them sanctified. But that part, that part there, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. And then Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, for that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again a third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel, obviously. But that verse we said in Hebrews chapter 2, we got to take the more earnest heed to the things that we heard, lest we let them slip. 1 Corinthians 15, keep these things in remembrance. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. You know, obviously the, the, the things of God should be on your mind every day. We got, a, we got a great treasure here that we're holding in our hands, obviously. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, it's page 1503. Romans chapter 12, 
I went verses, uh, verses 1 and 2. Look what it says here, Romans 12, verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, to beseech, that's earnest. I, I earnestly want you to do this with, with all my heart, Paul says. Paul saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, talking to us, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's free will. That's something that you got to do. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Look at this next word. Holy. Holy. You know, some of them old preachers back in the day, they emphasized holiness a lot. Sometimes they emphasized it so much that you people got discouraged and think, oh man, I, I can never live like that. And they would start equating that with salvation and things. Now, that's a little different story. But there ain't nothing wrong with trying to live a holy life, trying to live right. People call you all these names, a holy roller, a holy Joe, and all these stupid stuff. You know, like they try to mock you and scoff at you for trying to do what the Bible says. Holy, acceptable unto God. Look at this. I like this little part. Which is your reasonable service? It's reasonable. You know, God, my, my God, my God did all this for me. He, he gave himself for me. I think it's reasonable that we give ourselves to him. God's a reasonable God. That makes sense. Then look at verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not to be conformed to the world. You start conforming to the world, you know, that, that, oh, the world don't got nothing for you but sorrow. It'll let you down. It'll hurt you. It'll chew you up and it'll spit you out. That's what the world will give for you. I don't want nothing to do. I want what, the, what God got to do for me. All my trust is in God, not this, not this planet, you know. We got to have something far. Our hope cannot rest in this planet. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, like, if you're, if you're in Romans, flip a couple pages to the right. We went over this verse when we studied the book of Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. You were just in Romans, a couple books to the right. Corinthians. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So we're to renew our minds, we're not to be conformed. Look what, look what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 15. We'll back it up to verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. That's a, that's a big one. We, well, how, how, you know, that's why I, I emphasize this a lot. You know, how are we to judge things? It ain't my opinion. It's always what God says. We live in a day and age where now Christians, they don't know how to judge no more. I don't know what's good and bad anymore. Well, what do you mean? You've got to read the Bible. And I'll tell you. Look at verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We got the mind of God in a book here. And he talks about it in the same, same passage here. Look at verse 9. But, that, but as it is written, verse 9. Then in verse number you know, 11, he gets into the spiritual things. Uh, you know, what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Then look what Paul says in verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Then look at verse 13. The things which we speak not in words of man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Really, when you look at it, the Holy Ghost, he gives, he gives us words. Well, what words is he talking about? It ain't writing on the wall. I don't get no extra revelation from what God told me or nothing. The words of God, the mind of Christ, the mind of God is found in this book. And then it says comparing spiritual things with spiritual so obviously we ought to be analyzing the things going on around us and consulting God's word about the matter. Okay, now let's break it down a little bit, you know, practical. Consulting God's words, obviously, on social matters. Consulting God's word on, uh, on family matters. Uh, consulting God's words on the duties of marriage. Um, you know, consulting God's words on God, what do you want us to do next? You know, consulting God's book when we need answers, obviously. I believe everything we need to know is in this book. You know, it might not tell us how to, the, you know, how to cook a steak dinner or how to do this, you know, how to do this science project or figure out this quadratic equation or something. But it tells us everything that we really need to know at the end of the day. Now, look at, um, 
Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. It's page 1590. These are things we all ought to know. I went over, over and over and over again. But look at first, you know, but there's the thing. People sometimes they tend to forget it. They let these things slip. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. It says, This know also that in the last days, what's going to happen? Anybody want to say what's going to, what's it say? Perilous times. Perilous times shall come. Look at this thing. He runs down the list. The Apostle Paul runs down the list. And you tell me if this doesn't fit this present age. People say, ah, well, people are always like that. This, this thing is, is like, in this generation, because the rise of technology and, and the commercial advertisement business and all these connections that we got, this thing just rose up tenfold to what it ever was. Look at uh, verse 2. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. You know, people know you're narcissistic, you're egotistical. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. So what do they do? Oh, I, I'm going to go to war. I'm going to take you to war. I want something that you don't got. You know, wars and rumors of wars. Boasters. Now ah, look what I'm doing. You know, all this stuff about them. Boasters, they're boasting about it. Proud. I always like that thing. You, you notice and you take note on every time a president or roller mentions I. Back in the day, it was always... You know, God give us the glory. God give us the grace. God got us through this battle. God, got, you know, God gave us food while we were, it was raining in the middle of the night. We had to camp out over behind enemy lines and stuff. It was always God. Now what do you see in these, in these presidential politician speeches? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do that for you. It's all about I. You count how many eyes are in their speech. That shows you obviously how, how proud they are. Then it says blasphemers. They're blaspheming God, you know disobedient to parents now it's an attack at the children disobedient to parents you know and parents that want to raise up their kids the right way to do things right say watch out for the things of the world the kids are going to they're going to rebel and it says in the book of isaiah that the woman will roll over the man and the children the women and children will roll over the man you know nowadays the children are trying to roll the parents and the parents they're just so lost they're so they don't know how to discipline they don't know how to do nothing they're just it's like, a, it's just, it's a zoo. It's crazy. And then the women are going to roll over the men. It's interesting. We got a first woman vice president, you know. And, and, and I, you know, that's just how God set things up. Men are different than women. There's certain roles. You know, we're, not to, it, we're not to equate those two to be the same. That should be common sense. But it's not no more. <laughs> and that's something. Uh, men, are, men and women are the same, same things. We're equal, you know. What do you mean we're equal? We have different roles. We were set up, instituted by God with different characteristics, different things, different personalities. I've never seen an army of women ever take over a land. It was always men. You say, oh, well, you know, you're chauvinistic, you're sexist. No, it's just how things work. It's how God ordained it to be. You know, we got all these, these, these women, they just want to be in charge. They just want to roll over, roll over the men. And then the men, they lose, they submit. They submit to the women. Then the children overthrow the parents. That's reckless. That's crazy. That's what it says. Disobedient to parents. And then it says unthankful. Unthankful. Let that one sink in. Unholy. You know, unholy. They don't want to practice holiness. Put it in practice. Without natural affection. Reading a story the other day, this woman, she's taking care of kids. She decapitated the kid. And then she decapitated the dog. And then she called the police and said, the, the devil was attacking me. And then the police comes in the door, and they see blood everywhere. They see, a, they see these, these, this gruesome, violent scene, and she's in there singing. She's in there singing. That's demonic possession. That's something spiritual, man. Without natural affection, you're going to do that to a child? You know, a, a, a woman's going to pop out her, her kid and then throw the thing in the dumpster? N without natural affection. <laughs> this is in the last days, perilous times. You know, this stuff is, this is reality. It's what's happening. Without natural affection. And you're getting the whole thing. It's, it's not natural for two of the same people to, to be together. I don't care what, what, what they call me. That's just sticking for, up for the Bible. Keeping up with the times and stuff. You've got to change your, no. Without natural affection. Look at this, truce breakers. Truce breakers. That's a big one. I have to be on an international level. I used to be my ally. 
I used to have your back, now forget about it. Now, obviously, that thing goes around in a whole, down to a big scale, down to small individual scales, truce breakers. Now, and that's easy. People, divorce. God never wanted, never, never wanted divorce. God never divorced. He's never going to divorce me. I'm, I'm married to him forever. And next thing you know, I, I, we, we bicker. We have our first, our first little fight. And what, what, what am I going to do? Run down and get a divorce. <laughs> I'm going to be a truce breaker after I just told, just told vows and stuff. You know, now people, they just, they're truce breakers. It comes to marriage and all that stuff. False accusers. Look at this next word. Incontinent. They're just, they're not content with nothing. They're incontinent. No, no, no restraint. Look at this. Fierce. Um, they're, they're killers and stuff. Fierce despisers of those that are good. You got to watch out for that. Because now if you're trying to do good, they're going to despise you. They're going to try to do whatever they can, whether they use their tongue to try to bring you down to where they're at. And look at traitors. Uh, verse 4. Traitors. Heady, high-minded. We're trying to get to the moon. We're trying to get to Mars. I mean, we're living in a day and age that people are so high-minded, obviously. Look at this. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. I don't say that they just don't love God completely. That's what I look at it as like being as lukewarm. I'm, I'm, I'm God. I believe in God, you know, the man upstairs and spiritual. And I'm, you know, I go to church and stuff and they say all this stuff. But it says lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Now what? Well, look what it says in verse 6. Well, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Denying the power thereof. You know, that's why, blessed are they which thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. They don't, they're not thirsty for righteousness. They don't want no spiritual victory. Look what this says, though. From such turn away. You get away from them. You separate from them. Because they're going to try to bring you down. So you fulfill those things in that list. <laughs> so what's Paul say? Get away from them. From such, turn away. For this sort are they which creep into houses. They creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts. Verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're learning the wrong things. Come across in verse 12. Same chapter, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And the persecution comes in various forms. You know, don't just come in, we think of persecution, I think of getting stretched apart on the rack or getting hung over the fire like they used to do back in the day or getting go fed to the lions and stuff. Or persecution in America, praise the Lord, and it may not be that extreme. It may get to that point. I hope that it doesn't. But our persecution obviously comes on a smaller scale. Attacks from friends. Attacks from family members. Attacks from the, all these things. and Attacks from people in schools. And That's where the persecution we got to put up with. That's nothing to what our ancestors put up with when you think about it. That's why I like to study that stuff sometimes. And then verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving, deceiving the whole masses, deceiving and being deceived themselves. They honestly think they may be doing good up there trying to do the right thing for humanity and all these big goals and everything. But they're, whoever's feeding them, they're deceived, yet they're going to go out now they're going to deceive the masses. That's prophecy of what's going to happen in the, in the days we're living in. It's not, and that's Bible, it's 2 Timothy, it's the last book the Apostle Paul wrote. Evil men seducers shall wax worse and worse. Now, real quick, come, to, come back to the book of Matthew. Almost through here. <clears throat> book of Matthew, chapter 24. Um... <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. No way in the world I have time to expound this chapter. But Matthew chapter 24, I just want to point out a couple key things in verse number 5. Now I like this, you know. Now verse number 3, you back it up and look, look at the Lord's mentality here. You know, he sat down upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately. He said, tell us, what, tell us uh, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. 
Now listen, the whole purpose of this world system right now, it's designed to collapse. The whole thing's designed to fall down, collapse. Why? So they could rise up this new world order. Look up the whole thing on that, that whole big spiel. The new world order. We got to, it's going to have a one world roller. It's going to have a one world government. It's going to have a one world currency system. Forget about our dollar bills. and It's going to collapse. We've got to inflate it. We've got to wreck it. They're going to usher in this, this system of a one world currency, one world court, all this globalization. We're going to come together, and that thing's going to be ran by the devil himself. We studied two weeks. God manifest in the flesh. God in the flesh. Well, the tribulation period that's coming up in the future, it's the devil in the flesh. It's called the mystery of iniquity. We'll study that maybe in a couple weeks. But um, that's what's happening. And Paul says, the, uh, or one of the disciples said that at the, what would it be the sign of the coming in the end of the world? The end of the world as we know it, like right now, the end of this age in a sense. Now verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. And obviously Paul says evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, trying to deceive you while they're deceived. And then look at, look at verse 5. I have a couple of things highlighted in my book here. Verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. That's what this world's going to look for. They're going to look for this one man that's going to solve all these issues. It's going to be the devil himself. And no, no doubt he's going to use technology and these quantum computers and be able to look at the, look what's going on with Elon Musk. The guy's trying to implant a chip in, into your brain so that I could sit up here and tell you the capital of Zimbabwe. And I just say, hold on, let me think about it. And I'm tapping into my conscience and it's going to spit out facts like that. They're trying to tie up man and machine and things like that. This is stuff that was back on the sci-fi channel years ago. Now this stuff's coming to reality. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. Now, anyways, they're, people are going to say, I'm the Christ. And deceive many. You should have wars, rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places, places that don't usually get earthquakes. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And look what he gets into. Then they shall deliver you up and be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. Note that word many. Verse 5, many. Verse 10, many. Verse 11, many false prophets. Verse 12, the love of many shall wax cold. Notice how many times he said many. That's the majority. You know, that's why it's true Bible-believing Christians these days. It's, it's, thing, it's like minute to a point where people look at us like, you know, it's like some type of cult or something like that. You know, because we stand up for perfect words, stand up for, you know, the, the, the Bible and uh, what, what the word says. And it's in, notice this, though, the majority is going to be wrong. The love of, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, shall the uh, same shall be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom, which is preached unto all the world for witness unto all nations, then the end shall come. I don't got to get time to get into all this. Okay, we, we're saved by the gospel of the grace of God, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The gospel of the kingdom is a complete different gospel. That, now, for doctrinal teaching on this passage, this passage is directly aimed to the Jews. You, now, because that gets the whole thing. You, see, you study the Apostle Paul, we're caught out before this time. He's talking to the disciples. The disciples were Jews. Temple worshiping, Sabbath keeping, dietary law keeping, bearded. Jews, okay? He's talking to Jews here in verse 15. But there's a lot of practical things that we could get from these, you know? That's why there's always a doctrinal teaching. Who is this talking to? What time period is it talking to? But you can always get practical instruction in any verse in the Bible. Never forget that. But this is a different gospel. That gospel is being preached in the tribulation period. Now look at verse uh, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Now, right now, we live in the church age. We live in this time period right here. Now, we study in Corinthians, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. What's well, going to come to the tribulation period in the future, there will be a holy place. It'll be literally a, a rebuilt temple over there in Jerusalem or whatever. There's a, right there, there's always there's something different going on. 
stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Verse 16, look at this audience. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. I'm not in Judea. I'm over in the United States of America. Let them which be in Judea, over there in Israel, flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop. When's the last time you were hanging out on your roof? <laughs> we don't hang out on our roofs over here in America. But they hang out there on their roofs over in the Middle East. They got them flat roofs and stuff with, with railings around them and things. Let him which is on the housetop not come down and take anything of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And he says, Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on a Sabbath day. We don't, Paul talks about Romans 13. He didn't even mention a Sabbath day for a Christian. It's a Jewish audience, though. Then for then look at verse 21. It's a big, big verse here. I'm going to start winding it down. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Ain't that something? The, what Jesus Christ just said right there is there's going to come a time period. It's going to be worse than this world has ever seen before. No, there's been no other time like it. And obviously, you read the rest of the chapter, you go home and do that. He talks about the days of Noah. He talks about the days of Lot. And I studied them days. That was wicked times. And the Lord Jesus Christ said it's going to be worse than the days of Noah. Worse than the days of Lot. God flooded out the whole earth. That's why when God pours out his wrath on mankind, he catches out the body of believers. That's the whole point of the rapture. We'll get into that in a couple, probably a couple weeks. The point of the rapture. We're not here. God pours apart his wrath not on his own children, you know. He catches us out. We're, uh, we're caught up together to meet him in the air, in the clouds. And God pours out vengeance for seven years. He gives this world over to the devil. Literally, the old expression, you know, hell on earth happens. Yeah, that's literal. That thing happens for them seven years. And then what happens after that? Jesus Christ comes back down and sets up his kingdom for 1,000 years and fixes everything. Now, I was watching documentaries. I'm going to close up here. Uh, what do I want here? I want Second uh, Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I watched documentaries and seeing these people over there in Nairobi, Kenya. Horrible stuff, what's going on over there. Kids sleeping in these little concrete tunnels and sniffing this glue out of this plastic bottle and going, go, sniffing jet fuel that they smuggle from the airlines to get high. I mean, and it, the documentary was The Zombies of Nairobi. It was, I was clicked on, oh man, zombies in Nairobi, what am I going to see now? And that was scary. That was more scary than I ever seen any zombie movie in my life. The state that these people are in. And this guy was going to the slums. And I'm lo and looking around and people are just drugged out on all this stuff. I'm thinking, man, what a shame, you know. What, what could fix this? <laughs> Nothing could fix this except God coming back to planet Earth and setting up his kingdom and giving these people some hope, man. Giving some people, to, that's what they need. And, I, and that's, it's hard. You can't, you're not going to reach everybody. You're not going to be able to, to save everybody in this world. But... Thank God our God comes back down and says, you government, you people messed up my, this world for so much. i got to come back down and fix this thing. I'll show you how government's supposed to be ran. He runs that thing for a thousand years. That's a blessing. Now come down, look at 2 Timothy, though. I'm going to be done here. Look at 2 Timothy chapter... Uh, which one do I want here? 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now listen, I said all this, you know, as, as real Bible-believing Christians, the times that we're living in, these are to be, they're exciting. They're exciting times. They're motivating. They're actually encouraging. Because I know that we're getting down close to the finish line. And you read Paul's writing, he said, I've, I've fought the fight, I've finished my course, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous Lord shall give me, not only to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. Now that's that got to be encouraging. We're coming down to the, the finish line. What are you going to do, Quit? Well, we're going to back down, right? When at the, at the close, the Lord's coming back. We could be the generation where the Lord catches, up out, out, catches us out of here. And we're going to quit and we're going to go follow after the world. Come on. Paul says, I finished my course. W what the Lord had him to do. You know, and you got the judgment seat of Christ and it's like, you know, a course. I think a school, uh, you know. And you got the judgment seat of Christ and he grades you for what your work is and rewards you accordingly. Keep that in mind, obviously. That, that's a blessing. Look at, look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. You know, while the news is trying to get you to
fear everything under the sun and all these fear tactics. Why? So they could control you better. So that, that you're just stuck in, oh, what's next? What's going on next? And then it brings about anxiety, brings about all kinds of other stuff. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. <clears throat> it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If any man is trying to get you, get you afraid, you got to go back and consult the Word of God. It's comforting. Uh, you get power, spiritual power within your walk, and it gives you a sound mind. What I got to, what I got to believe, what I got to think about, and all this stuff. Um, look at, look at Philippians. A couple more verses. Um, Philippians chapter four. I want, that's page fifteen sixty five. And now, us Christians, what we can do to capitalize on this, this crazy times we're living in, is to, it's a good time because people are more, maybe some more are acceptable to, uh, I need some hope in life. I need, I need some, to help guide them a little bit. Give them the gospel. You know, what people are missing, they, they're missing the peace, the peace with God, and they're missing the peace of God. How do I get the peace, how do I get peace with God? When back in the day I was an enemy against them. I was, I was an alien against, I was, I was a foreigner, I wasn't a citizen of God, I wasn't a child of His. Well, in order to get peace with God, you've got to go through the blood. It says it in Romans chapter 5. Therefore we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, who gave Himself for us and things. It's the only way, people to get peace with God, and then the peace of God, that's more conditional. You know, the peace of God. Look, look, look at uh, Philippians 4 verse uh, 6. I like even verse five, like verse four. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You do those things right there, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. They ought to look at us Christians and say, man, how in the world he got some peace in these times like this? Because we've got the peace of God. We've got the peace with God. We know where our destination is. We've got God's book. Which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. You know, Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is peace and life. So obviously if you're saved, you know, you could look around all this stuff and, and have some peace, have some encouragement, have some motivation to draw close to the Lord, finish the fight, finish the race. Um, you know, I like, you know, run your own race. People are so tempted, what's he doing? What's she doing? What's this doing? Think about ourselves. How are we running the race for the Lord? And hopefully we finish strong, you know? And if you're not saved, well, obviously get saved. And I do believe that everybody in this room, you know, has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. As their, as their Lord and Savior and understood that he died for your sins and was buried and rose again a third day of the gospel. Um, now it's a point of, you know, stir us up to stand against all this stuff, to consult God's word. So um, I'm not going to give no gospel invitation here or nothing like that. I do believe it. Everybody sitting here is a saved Christian. I'm not going to try to scare you out of your salvation or nothing like that here. So let's just bow our heads for closing prayer. We'll be through. <clears throat> I do, Lord God, Heavenly Father. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I just thank you for um, laying this on my heart last night, Lord. I thank you for, um, this is absolutely nothing, Lord, if you weren't in it. I pray, Lord, that you bless the message. I pray, Lord, that you, uh, you know, for all of us that are here this morning, that we don't let these things slip. And that, that we always remember that we have your word. You know, we could look around this earth, Lord. It, all, it seems to be falling apart and going downhill and wars and rumors of wars, Lord. But we look back and... At the end of the day, that's the scriptures being fulfilled before our eyes. And we're living in these times, Lord. Uh, I pray, Lord, that um, you encourage uh, the body of Christ. Encourage everybody in here. Motivate them. Stir them up, Lord, to draw closer to you than ever before in these times, Lord. We thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you for your precious blood shed on the cross and your resurrection the third day, Lord. Uh, we give you all the praise and glory and honor. Uh, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. All righty, let's... Uh, Let's sing a song and we're going to be through. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, Red Book. Stand up and sing page 242. I don't think we ever did this one. What's up? I don't think you ever did this one. That's a good one now. Okay. <laughs> I have not done this one. One, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. Jesus I come, page 242. Thank you all for hanging in there with me this morning.